from the heart of Dubai, where tomorrow is being built today to the world. Welcome to the CTO Show with Mehmet. Here, we redefine technology and reimagine possibilities. With Mehmet, delve into the riveting realms of AI, cybersecurity, and digital technology. Experience the thrilling highs and lows of startups. Immerse yourself in the spirit of entrepreneurship and witness the future of business innovation being written in real time. Now, without further ado, let's tune in and explore the future. Hello and welcome back to a new episode of the CTO Show with Mehmet. Guys, today I'm very happy and you are seeing me smiling. Why? Because it's first time on the show, I get someone who we share um, the same, I would say, career path because I've done this job for a long time, for more than 10 years as an SE. Today I have with me Jay, who's, you know, based in, in Los Angeles, working for Pantera. Jay, thank you very much for being, and I'm very happy to have, you know, someone from an SE background with me. So welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do. Yeah, Mehmet, thank you so much. I've, I'm also very excited to be here. You're, we're cut from the same cloth. And um, yeah, so a little bit about me. Uh, I've been in, in technology since I was uh, 17, so uh, 20 years now at this point. Uh, I'm 37. Um, born and raised in New York City. That's where I started my career. I started with working in law firms in the financial district in New York City, um, crossing ground zero every day, and ended up in, after uh, going through that, went through college, got a computer engineering degree, worked for an insurance company for a little bit out, outside of uh, once I got out of college and then ended up in the cybersecurity realm as a SE, a sales engineer, solutions engineer. And I've been doing that ever since. So my background is has been engineering solutions such as DLP, data loss prevention, MFA, multi-factor authentication. Um, NDR, network detection and response, EDR, endpoint detection and response. PAM, Privilege Account Management, and just recently uh, in my current role, doing red teaming and, and automated security validation. So I've seen the gamut. I've worked with many different industry verticals and, and, and have consulted with many different clients, seeing all different types of challenges in the, in the cybersecurity world. And believe me, there's a lot of challenges. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Uh, you know, like it's kind of a traditional question, but I'm curious because Everyone, especially us who works in tech, um, you know, there's something uh, or maybe an event that happened. Sometimes you get inspired by someone. So you decided to go into the tech, right? So what brought you to, to the tech industry, Jay? Um, I, I, I would love to hear from you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great question. So I, I was always, and, and I still am, a self-proclaimed nerd. Right. I, I love all different types of tech and, and all, all different types of things regarding computers and technology. But um, growing up, mm -hmm. I'll never uh, specifically what got me into cybersecurity was I remember as a kid um, back in the 90s, right, when AOL started becoming a, a thing um, for us in the States. I remember getting an email from one of my buddies in high school, and I thought it was his email. And he sent me an attachment and I downloaded it and it just wrecked my machine. It was classic, classic phishing email and it was malware and I had to like reformat everything. And it was such a pain. And, um, it was so painful that I said, man, this sucks. And, and since then I, I that intrigued me the whole, the whole, like, why would somebody want to do that? Why would attackers do what they want to do? And how can we stop them like that? That really influenced me, not only just to get into technology, but to get specifically into cybersecurity, which is a whole realm in itself. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Uh, and of course, it's not, you know, people think, Jay, sometimes that being in cybersecurity is something fun and, you know, you are the guy who's, you know, like uh, playing with all the hacking tools, but people, they don't see actually, you know, what is underneath and, you know, how hard it is um, to secure, you know, your first, your, your own assets like your machine your email and you know your your stuff and then get it to to the broader thing now before we go into your you know like as se we're going to talk about the se role the solution sure. engineer, engineer role yeah but 
let's go one step back because you mentioned, you know, the event that triggered you, you received an email and then it was a phishing email and, you know, the, the machine was wiped out. Now, if we can put a kind of framework and say, okay, cybersecurity 101, right? So what is the whole thing is about? Because for some people, cybersecurity is like, you know, this mysterious thing where, you know, there's a guy sitting in the, in the garage wearing a hoodie, he tried to do things, right? Um, and I love to, you know, get your opinion on this and get your say on that because, unfortunately, people think that cybersecurity, okay, we know it's something interesting, it's, it's like, yeah, it's real. But it's only for, you know, the big guys, you know, the guys who has the money, like why I should care, right? So what you can tell us about that? Yeah, I, I think what we need to understand is something that I talk about a lot now, especially in my current role, is the attacker's mindset. And the attacker's mindset really could be anything, right? There, it, could, it could be they're attacking you or an organization for financial gain. Or they're attacking you just to get it, build a name for themselves. Or they're attacking you just because they want to. They're bored. Like all these different reasons would cause attackers to do something nefarious, something bad. And it's relevant because whether or not you're working for a big organization or you're just someone with a small business or it's just yourself, there's, there could be reasons that someone is looking to get after you and compromise you. And at the very I always talk about this. I spent so much time in the identity realm, but really your identity is so valuable. Think about just who you are as a person, the money that you might have, uh, the, the privileges you might have, the people that you know, all of that is valuable to an attacker because you may be part of a larger scale attack. Maybe you know someone important or maybe you know someone who's performing a certain job function. And with your identity or with, 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 with them, with attackers pretending to be you, they can potentially do more. So it's always important to understand that because people get into the mindset of, oh, why would they come after me? You shouldn't be thinking that way. You are valuable. Your identity is valuable uh, no matter what. That's 100%. And this is also what I tell people. And now, you know, I'm not talking also about individuals. Individuals should, should take care because at the end of the day, you know, everyone has a digital identity nowadays. Now, the reason I asked you this question, Jay, on purpose, and you mentioned the identity, I tell this to startups because I focus some of my work that I do with startups, companies, you know, like founders who are just, you know, you know building things from, from scratch. And I tell them, guys, one of the things that you should care about in cybersecurity is actually, you know, your identity, as you mentioned, and your IP, intellectual property, right? So because usually this is what the, uh, these guys are after. And the reason they do it is they want to cause the maximum damage possible to you. So whether it's like a reputation loss, financial loss, uh, you know, like, and all of these other uh, motives, I would say. Now, Jay, you are on, on out, if I am correct me if I'm mistaken, but you know, the field you are in today with your current uh, role is more into the, um, let's call it, can, can we call it like uh, a defensive or is it the aggressive, I mean, let's say uh, you are on the offensive, sorry, uh, uh, part of, of the game. Because in cybersecurity, you have the defensive methods and then you have the offensive ones where you try yourself to, to take the step uh, ahead of the attackers. So with your current role today, where in, in this like spectrum you are? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. So in my current role uh, in the company I work for, Pantera, we are more on the attacker side more than the defender side. Um, and it's important because for so long, when you think of cybersecurity, you think of defense, defense, layer, defense, layer, defense, which is all correct, right? It's an absolute necessary part of, of your security posture. But how do you know those levels and the things that you, those walls and controls that you put up, how do you know they're working right? You have to test them. How do you test them? You have to attack yourself. And you don't want to wait for attackers to do it because then it's too late. If you can proactively attack yourself and understand, ah, this worked, this worked, but this one didn't work, but this worked. Okay, so we only have one thing we need to fix. Well, you're in a much better position after knowing and being proactive than if you were just waiting for an actual attack. 
And that's what so we bas- do. So basically, you know, the pen testing is, you know, like uh, it's the, the act of trying to hack yourself in, I mean, it's like not hacking in the bad way, but it's in, 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 in the testing more than check for the readiness. Now, uh, from what you are seeing, Jay, uh, a lot of issues when it comes to cybersecurity in general. Like, we hear a lot of uh, stories, you know, the news was full the past two, three weeks about, you know, what happened in the entertainment, for example, with MGM and with other places. So what are, you know, the, the biggest challenge you are seeing happening currently? And are you seeing this continuing to rise or is it something that's going to reach some kind of a plateau and then maybe decrease? What is your... Take? I can tell you right now, nothing's decreasing. Nothing is stopping, right? I mean, it's only been getting been getting worse over the years. And those of us in the cybersecurity industry, we laugh. We say, oh, it's job security, right? But it, it, but re- the reality of it is, is it's, it's, um, it can be a little disheartening because you see things happening all the time. And, and I tell you what, the people who are being affected are regular civilians, people every day who are just trying. So for example, those in Las Vegas, right? Which is very close to me, right? I mean, I was there not too long ago for the Black Cat conference. Um, those are the people getting affected, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it's, uh, it's challenging. But to answer your question, I, I don't see it decreasing. And, and what's, I think what's challenging for security professionals is that organizations can fall into the trap of this can't happen to us or we're not a target. And it's, it's hard because security is not a revenue driving activity of any organization, right? right. You don't, you don't get money from saying, I'm going to implement all these controls. In fact, it's the opposite. Usually there's operational pushback and it can be challenging because you're, you're implementing controls that can stop people from sometimes from being productive. And that's not good either. However, look at what's going on at any attack that has happened within the last three, four years or whenever the damage that, that, that resulted, whether it was damage from brand, like you said, or just monetarily because either systems are going offline or in the worst case scenario, there's a ransomware attack and now things are encrypted. Now you have to pay just to continue operations. You have to pay. It's, um, that's, that's very tough. So what I, what would be ideal is if organizations took this as they said, you know, oh, or ran, ran through assessments and said, okay, this is a critical line of our business. If this were to go away, would it, would it spell certain doom? What could happen? Oh, ransomware or, or anything else. And you treat a cyber attack the way you would treat any other risk incident. And then you try and mitigate appropriately. Yeah, hundred percent. And I know the challenge because, you know, I, I was doing the consulting part also as well. And the biggest uh, struggle that usually CISOs, Chief Information Security Office, they, they, they face is, you know, when, when you buy any product in, in any organization, so usually you have the ROI and the total cost of ownership and all yep. this stuff. While with, with cybersecurity products, it's because you, you're, you're trying actually to prevent a loss from happening. So it's not like a tangible one. Yeah. And I always used to make the similarity. So when you sell or you you're dealing with cybersecurity from from a commercial perspective, you're dealing actually with kind of a life insurance or any insurance scheme. Yes. Because, yeah, because, okay, I I can say, okay, why I'm paying X thousands of dollars, X grand per year for my car insurance, and I would never make an accident, but you never know, right? And same for the life insurance, same for the insurance, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, this is why it's important. But now, some, you know, Sometimes I hear this from people as well. They say, okay, look, like we, we have in really invested in security. So we built the best firewalls. We brought the best in breed. I don't know what. We have our ADRs, XDRs, this, that, you know. So, and really, you know, they've spent, you know, really big amounts of money on this. But still these attacks happen. Why, you know, it's kind of an education message here, guys. And I wanted you to hear from Jay. Why? But it's, you know, it's like, it's not a one-time task. It's not like just a marathon, it's a sprint. Why they need to keep actually investing in, in their cybersecurity infrastructure? It's a, 
it's extremely challenging, right? I, I said this recently uh, on a different podcast. I, I really feel for anybody in the industry because you you need to have the ongoing support and why, right? What's the key word there? Ongoing. And the program, the security program needs to be exactly that. It needs to be continuous, whether that's continuous testing and, and just continuous. You always have to be vigilant in that mindset that you can't take your foot off the gas because as soon as you get complacent, this is where there's drift in your posture or drift in, 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 your, in your security posture where gaps tend to happen and then thing, and things tend to happen. And, and that is essentially the biggest challenge because it's not just technology. It's people processing mm -hmm. technology. It's part of a trifecta. And you can have all the technology in the world, but if you don't have the right processes, you're going to fail. And if you have, to, if you have technology and, and, and process, but your people don't care, you haven't advocated within your organization for security, it's going to fail. So you need to have, it's, it's extremely challenging. This is, this is why they're, this is why attacks keep, keep happening. And, and I'm not saying that attacks don't happen because of negligence. Sometimes that's the case as well. But this is why we continue to see this because there, there, nothing is a hundred percent. Never, you yeah. can never bring risk down to zero. And that's challenging. And I think to be as ready as possible. So when something happens, you can respond quickly and understand and know that's the best situation you can hope to put yourself in. That's true hundred percent now. And I'm not challenging Jay. I'm just, um, trying to tell you a few of the thoughts that I used to hear. Yeah, yeah. Now people comes and say, okay. Fine. We understand this. We need to keep this like it's an ongoing process. We need to keep training our uh, stuff. We need to keep investing. We need to keep, as you said, the ongoing support and so on. Um, but I said, you know what? Like now we are into a kind of reach a fork where you know we have a bunch of decisions to make and we don't know because everyone is coming to us and say, hey, you need to have my solution because you would be in a better position. And now back prioritization became a big issue. So what are you seeing, you know, uh, because you talk to customers, of course, like all the time, Jay. So, so what are you seeing them doing to kind of prioritize these decisions? Um, and, and if you can advise anyone who might be listening to us today, how they should prioritize, you know, okay, which projects should go first or which technology should go first? Yeah. It's a great question because, yeah, if you've ever walked the trade show floor, there are so many tools and technologies and companies out there. Right? How do you prioritize what you should do first? And whenever I talk to organizations, I always, I always bring the conversation back to, to risk and what's critical to the business. And that's going to vary depending on the industry vertical that you're in. So if you're in retail, the ability to process credit cards and sell is going to be your priority as opposed to if you're in healthcare, the, the, the priority is going to be the health and safety of your patients and their information, as opposed to if you're in finance or you're a financial institution, it's going to be that financial related information. So what, what, what you need to first understand is what is your business and what is critical to your business and what would be, like I mentioned earlier, if something were to be on that critical path, if let's say go again, retail, right? I'm selling, I don't know, I'm selling light bulbs. <laughs> right? Cause I'm looking at a light bulb here in my studio. I'm selling light bulbs is if something is going to prohibit the sale of those light bulbs, well, that is what I need to prioritize first. That's the criticality. That's what I need to make sure when we talk about security, right? We're always talking about, um, the CIA triad, right? Confidentiality, right. integrity, and availability. Well, I need to make sure that I, the, the, the availability of me to sell those light bulbs is always on hundred percent. That's what I'm going to prioritize. And I'm going to focus on that first because that's critical. If that goes down, my business goes down. That's what I focus on. That's what I always talk about. I, I say, what's critical to your business? Okay. Oh, well, we need to. And sometimes it's driven by compliance. That's a separate topic because compliance will tell you to do certain things. And I don't necessarily feel that just because you're compliant means you're secure. But mm -hmm. if you're secure, usually you can also be compliant, right? Uh, but to answer your question, that is where I, what I advise organizations to do. That's what I see as well, that they are prioritizing what is important for their business to keep their business flowing and making sure that those assets, those critical parts of the business are protected 
uh, and, and always on and available. Great. Exactly. I agree with you on that point, Jay. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about being a sales engineer or SE, as the yeah. people know us. Some people, they know us as technical consultants, pre-sales yep. consultants. We go by different names, guys. So, yeah. um, I, I'm, of course, like still, I, I have my own thing, but I call myself the uh, lead consultant <laughs> yep. because I, I, I love, you know, being this. Um, first, like what attracted you? Okay, we, you told us about how you get attracted to tech and cybersecurity, but what attracted you to be an SE, actually? Yeah, I think it was the fact that I like, you know, being an SE sales engineer, and you're correct, so many different titles for it. It allows you to get exposure to many different environments and many different clients. So in this role, it, it's, and it, what's interesting is that I'm noticing, at least here in the States, um, there's been a lot of, of, of interest in being an SE, being a sales engineer. And um, oh, oh, I've seen it grow over the last couple of years as opposed to, again, I've been doing this for so long, like 14 years at this point, but just recently I'm seeing more. So for those, anyone who wants to get in, it, it's, it's a role in which you need to, of course, have some technical acumen so you can, because you need to be able to advise your customers to make the appropriate choices. Now, usually, right, if you're a sales engineer, you have a, a product that you're helping to engineer. So it's going to be related to whatever product that you're for the organization that you're working for. But to answer your question, what really um, drawed me to it was the ability to try and solve problems and solve what we call pain in the industry, right? Oh my gosh, like going back to my light bulb, I can't see anything. <laughs> All right, I got this light bulb here. And by the way, this light bulb is going to be uh, a certain brightness. and It's going to be a certain color. And as a result, this light bulb is going to help you do X, Y, and Z. Right. I want we want to solve problems and we can solve problems with tools and with process and by advising. And that's what this role is all about, is really trying to help customers and clients solve the pain that they're experiencing with the technology. Yeah. So they call us guys, the trusted advisors for customers. Jay, how much you agree with me? And I shared this multiple times and sometimes even I, I copy paste the same post and I have no shame of repeating this. I, co I compare, you know, sales engineers to startup founders because exactly the same thing that you mentioned, you're looking for problems to be solved. You try to evaluate this with your customer and then you prove that your solution works and then you show the results. Like, okay, you tell the customers, Mr. Customer, you, you know, previously you were on doing this in X amount of time. Look, now we are making it much, much faster. Or you are having like 10 people to do this task. Now you can have only two staff and the rest of eight, you can allocate them to, to do something else. How, you know, you, you think this is accurate of you feel like you are in kind of always startup mode when you are an SE? Yeah, I mean, yes, because every you're you're always encountering something new, and it requires you to think out of the box in many different times. Because, like I said, no environment's different. So you're gonna you're going to see you know this in 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 some situations. You're going to see that in other situations, and you have to think quickly because you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing for your customer. Um, and that does require you to first understand what's happening, make decisions, engineer a solution, prove it out. Right. So, so um, it's not just snake oil, right? It's not smoke and mirrors like this. The solution actually works and, and, and then make sure that, uh, you know, moving forward that they're going to be in a better situation. Like you said, right. Hey, now with this solution, you're going to be X times better or faster or whichever. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that, that the ingenuity and thinking on your feet that never stops. And it is almost like being, you know, a CEO or, or you have to, because you have, you can't, you can't be complacent. You always have to be learning and growing with the industry as well, because you will encounter customers that have the latest technology or, right, I've encountered so many smart people in, in my time with clients. And, I, and I, 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 smart people always motivate me because, oh, man, I need to get smarter, right? And, and, and uh, it, it requires you to challenge yourself. It really does. Right. And how much important, and, you know, this is for anyone who's considering to be NSE, um, how much also you put 
because you 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 are actually you lead the team in Americas with Pentera today, right? So, and from a leadership perspective, I'm asking this question to you, Jake. How important is not only to focus on the technical aspect of the job, which is yes, indeed, it's, it's needed. You need to understand what you're saying. Like, tell me a little bit more about the soft skills that a good SE should have. It's um, that's an excellent question because the in my experience, and I've like I said, I've worked with a lot of talented people, including on the sales engineering side. The most talented SEs that I've encountered in my career were able had those soft skills, and 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 it's a very it's a generic term. So what are some of them? Are you asked? Well, the ability to of course discuss and articulate the the importance of whatever you're dis, your, whatever you're engineering, but also having the discernment to listen and take information and, and not just speak, 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 speak. You have to listen to your clients and understand what's happening. You have to be able to think on your feet. And I, and I think the, the greatest trait that an SE can have is agility. And why do I say that? Agility is a myriad of all different um, aspects rolled into one. When you're agile, you can, you can be like water as Bruce Lee used to say, right? You can fit into any object. You can go this way, you can go that way, you can go this way, and it, it allows you to be flexible because oftentimes, right, these soft skills, which includes teamwork, or you want to be able to talk with your sales rep and you want to be have a game plan coming in, that game plan might go out the window because your client may say, yeah, but I have XYZ requirement. Oh, oh, I didn't think about that. Okay, well, let's let's move in, let's go this way. So those soft skills to, be, to, to have discernment, to listen, to think on your feet, be agile, are all what's really important when you're with your clients because you want to make sure your clients and your customers are, are getting the, the best of you and the best of your technology, whichever your, whatever solution you're trying to engineer for them. But it requires you to, to listen and, and articulate and communicate properly and take your time and it's it's a lot of things put together i don't know if that answers your question or not it does indeed and you know it, it you know it's it's like articulating which is mainly you know everything goes into communication in 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 my opinion um and when i say communication maybe it's a broad word i know it's a broad term but you know you, but you covered it all actually today like it's actually how to articulate the business requirements to technical terms when you talk to the customer. And then you mentioned something which I think it's underrated. It's about the communication between your, so for the guys who doesn't know, uh, in, in, in enterprise sales, so do you have the sales rep and you have his SE or her SE or he or she and vice versa. And they, they have, they are a team, right? So, so you have someone who's just on the business side, he do the pitch, you know, he talks to the customer, manage the deal, you know, commercially. And you have the real hero who is the SE who does the job actually, right? <laughs> and, and it's important because the SE, in my opinion, and, you know, I want to hear your opinion also as well. Actually, I'm not, and I'm, by the way, I, in my last uh, role, I was an AE. I was not an SE. Okay. Right? So, and I'm not saying this to, to underrate AEs. But uh, SEs plays a major role, actually, to, let's be honest, like to, to get all the elements of the deal almost done together. Of course, like the AE has to, to build the relationship and, you know, work on the commercials and so on. But really, the SE is, is usually who's sitting in the driving seat, right? Yeah, I, I would say, I, I would say it's, it's almost where, you know, you can relate it to professional sports. Um, think, think of, you know, a, a football team. Um, and by football, I'm, I'm talking soccer for if there's any Americans. <laughs> <Let's> <laughs> say, okay. I have mixed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but notice, right, you're trying to score goals and win as a team. It requires people in different positions. And, and I would say that the way, if you want to also relate it to your driving analogy, right, you're trying to get to the destination. Well. The sales, the sales rep might identify, hey, okay, here's the car, and they're gonna get, they're gonna drive a certain part of the way. But yeah, then you're gonna switch. 
and the SE is going to drive a good portion of the way. And then you're going to switch again. And the sales rep is going to, to, to finish things. Why? Well, because you need to understand, you have to find clients that are looking for a solution. But then the engineering of that solution is going to be on the SE, the sales engineer's responsibility. And then all everything else that comes along with that at the end, after what we in the industry call technical win or technical validation, once your client goes, yeah, you know what? This solution does do what I want it to do. Great. Everything else that follows, um, the uh, paperwork and, and logistics and contracts, your sales rep will handle, right? But that's at the end. So it's almost like, you know, again, you're on a team. I have a ball. I'm going to pass the ball or they're going to pass it to me. I'm going to do some things and I'm going to pass it back. But it requires both individuals to be in lockstep with each other. And I'll tell you, the worst thing that can happen is as an SE or as a sales rep, you're not getting along with your sales engineer or vice versa. You're not getting along with your account executive. That's rough. It's just mm -hmm. not going to work. It's rough. So like, you put two, two, um, two, pe two people in the field who never met before and you tell them you have to play as a team now. <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's challenging, but here's where I challenge, and this is where I challenge all SEs to take ownership of that relationship. Meaning, you're right, it's Ooh. tough. I don't, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know who this person is. That's okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure I take the responsibility to get to know that person, because I, it's in my best interest as a team to understand what makes this person tick. What do they, what do they, what do they like? What, what annoys them? What, how do you like to communicate your style of communication? Do you like to communicate on a regular basis once a week? I've had sales reps say, no, I don't want that. Call me. Okay. I'm going to, I have to be flexible, right? I have to work with this person. I have to make this work and I'm going to do everything I can to make it work because it's in my best interest to make it work. Right. hundred percent. Now, because we cover here on the show, sometimes, you know, startups and some of these startups would be tech startups, right? And they would need to have people on the ground like yourself or myself back in the days as SEs. How important from your experience, Jay, because you've been doing this for a long time, is to have this communication between the field and, you know, the engineers. And when I mean the engineers here, the people who write the code and, you know, like the, 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 anyone who's reporting to the CTO of the company. And maybe we are discussing it because we have experience in it, but for any technical founder or someone new to this, they, I believe they need to, to learn about this part, about getting the feedback from the field through SEs. So what's your experience here? Now it's very important because you're, if you're in the, the CTO role, your SEs are your troops. They are in the front lines and they're in the battlefield and they're going to be seeing things that you may not see be because you're just not at the, if, you know, if you're, you're, and again, everyone has their function and role, right? So the SE's function is really to get in front of clients and test and, and do proof of values where you're doing the technical validation. But as a result, because like I mentioned, the SE's are seeing many different environments, they're going to get exposure to things that the, the team in HQ may not just may not see. So you're going to want to get that feedback, not only about the technology, but about your clients and customers. Because again, the needs of someone in healthcare is gonna be different from the needs of someone in, in retail, who's gonna be different from the needs of someone in, in industry or, or whichever. And getting that feedback will allow you to make the appropriate business decisions. So for example, maybe to hit a certain industry vertical, that industry vertical is giving feedback to your SEs that we need function A, B, and C. You can now make a decision of, well, is function A, B, and C a viable path to integrate into this tool or technology? Well, it's going to cost this much. Okay, it's going to cost this much and take this amount of time. But if we do that, the amount of potential revenue that we can get from this industry vertical is large. Well, then it's worth the investment. But if it's not, yeah then maybe we don't do it yet. Maybe we, we, we deprioritize it. So all that information is going to be coming through your SEs because they're going to be the ones interfacing with customers and clients on a continual basis. 100%. And I always have um, you know, something I keep repeating and telling. If you are a CTO into a B2B space, you know, 
you're lucky because you have, or you will have, hopefully, SEs, which are, as you mentioned, Jay, your troops in the field who are getting you all the feedbacks and, you know, because in a B2C, it's very hard to do it because you can't really, you need to do like market research. You need, you need to, to send someone, you know, do mystery shopping and you need to do all these things. And you're not sure actually because you're, you know, you're talking to, you know, it depends on the sampling that you, you are using. You know, you, you never know, right? So, so it, it takes more time and, you know, you need to do a lot of A-B testing. While in B2B, SEs, they are filtering all this to you because, you know, after a while, especially if you are a new product, you know, in a couple of months, they, you start to get the same feedback as you mentioned. For example, hey, listen, people are asking for this feature and now it's not like, not one, not two, not three. I have like six customers which say, if you have this feature, I would consider buying your product, right? And then this will help the CTO to, to prioritize. It will help the product management team to prioritize. And by the way, this is maybe one thing we, we didn't mention, Jay, is like the SE communicate not only with, I mean, from internal perspective, not only with the sales rep and the CTO, whoever, like you talk to product managers, the, the people who are responsible for the product roadmap, and you speak to, you know, other colleagues as well. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a fun it's a fun one, I would say. So from career path perspective, Jay, if someone decides to become an SE, like where is the top thing that he or she can reach? Yeah, it's a well, it's a it's a great question. Um, is your question more in regards to entering the industry or where do you go once you are an SE? So once you are an SE, so where they can see themselves in the future? Oh yeah, I mean there there's there's a couple of different things. You could grow into, into leadership, which is uh, leading a team. And that, that has two different aspects as well, right? Whether you're inheriting a team, which is a, a unique challenge, or if you're building a team, which is also a unique challenge, uh, that's one thing. Or you can end up growing into uh, what's called like, organizations typically have like a specialist role, meaning um, you, are, you are the man or the woman or whatever. You are the person, right? That is the subject matter expert, and you're the, you are the person that everybody goes to, all the SEs go to, right? That could be, you know, I've heard that called principal in certain, in certain organizations, a principal SE, right. advisory SE, right? So you can be the, 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 the top person. Um, and that is also unique because sometimes these roles are global, right? Like, you know, you have so much expertise and you know the product so well that again, you're in a global role now and you, you help the and you try and, and and work with the largest clients and and the most complex environments and and that is another potential path um for for individuals and sometimes right sometimes maybe you just want to stick to your patch meaning in the industry right your patches um again i'm in california so it could be the west coast it could just be california maybe you don't want to travel so much you only want to stick to your region that's okay too right and that's and that's and you can you can you can still add a lot of value by working in an individual region because there's still a need there, right? To for for SE and for for technical support and and technical sales validation. Great, great, and I agree with you also as well here, um, Jay. Like, okay, so so when we talked about how it's similar to be in a startup mode when when you know you work. Um, as an SE, but from also personality perspective, uh, I would say how, you know, especially like for you, because you live, you live on the West coast and, you know, yeah. majority of the time, you know, these startups would be there. So how that, you know, I can say shaped also your choices when, when joining companies, like, did you prefer to be in, in like, you know, established places where everything is, you know, set up and, you know, everyone knows how things go and there are processes and so on. Or do you prefer to have, you know, the, let's say, not the challenge, but let's say, you know, the, the struggles and, uh, you know, these all nice things that happen in the startup. So where did you see yourself more? Yeah, it's absolutely, there's, <laughs> di there's differences. And I don't think that, I don't think there, one is, better than the other it's it's all what's good for you at your current point in your life to make that decision right and i had never 
I'm working for, you can consider Pantera almost a scale up now. Like we grew tremendously in the last two years that I've been here. Um, those they're like I said, they're unique challenges for each. There's challenges in each, in each, in each case. Um, if you are working or you go to work for as an SE for a very established company, that means that that company has processes and procedures already established, but it also may mean that the technology that you're engineering and selling may be in a saturated market, right? Which is its own challenge because now every time you go into a client, you're going to get into a knife fight with competitors. And that's, that could be, that's challenging, right? As opposed to exactly you work for a startup, right? Okay. Now you're in a, in a, in a new world, but also the challenge there is that no one, you're maybe working with such a new technology that no one knows what you even do. And that's a challenge in itself. So it's, it all depends on what challenges you want. I think that if you're looking to really push the limits of what you can do from a creativity perspective and understand exactly, and you want to be, you want to have more of a, um, a say or more of an impact moving into a, a startup or a smaller organization gives you more of an opportunity to do so because things that you create or um, the processes that you develop or just the uh, the work that you do may have a bigger impact because there's not that many people there in the organization to begin with. And um, that can be very rewarding. And it can also be very stressful because because there's not many people, everyone can be um, strapped, right? It, it could be like you right. know, everyone could be in, in many different directions. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword, as we say, right? There's benefits and there's also challenges. But I don't think there's any, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a wrong answer, right? For someone, no. here's what I would say though, right? For someone entering and trying to become, first become an SE, I wouldn't necessarily go to a startup because startups do require you to have more experience. But again, because there's not many things established as processes, procedures established. So I would, if you were first getting into the industry, I would go to somewhere, an, an organization that's a little bit larger that could, um, you could take your time with onboarding and just get a little bit more flexibility with learning the ropes of being a sales engineer, wherever that is. Yeah. And just to the point, because I remember, you know, and there's another story here. So you, we talked about startup scale ups and you are in the U S so usually when these startup scale ups comes to, to our region here, so we are starting up all again, right? So. Uh, because you have to start from zero. And I remember myself on many occasions in all the, um, you know, the, the companies that I had the honor and privilege to work with, you know, I was not only the SE. So yeah, I joined as an SE, but I found out myself being the marketing guy. I found myself to be the sales rep. I found myself being even, you know, the, um, the, the white paper uh, guy who's writing a white paper to be published on, on the company website. And I found myself to be the, speaker on on the stage and it's, it's is it was it stressful like i was already get getting tired yeah sometimes but it was very very rewarding actually because you know and you know when when to your point when you start to build also yourself things because you know you don't have time to do many things at the same time so you need to start to automate or delegate i would say so i was lucky enough you know to, to say okay if i spot something which is you know getting repeated many many times the first question I ask, how I can automate this? Can I build something that I can automate this? Whether maybe it's a simple script, you know, um, that I can run and I keep it on, on autopilot, or maybe it's something more advanced that I can build. And this was always my motivation. Yeah, like, okay, I'm getting tired, but this will be rewarding. I'm learning new things, 100% on this. Now, you know, I know like we, we, we talked about the place you work at uh, today, Bay Pantera. And you know what? When I go to the website, the thing that I see is automated security. And we are just, I just mentioned automation. So what is the story of automation? And, you know, where do you see, not only with Pentera, so where do you see the automation in the whole cybersecurity coming back, you know, to the roots, as they say? And, you know, the thing that everyone talks about today, the AI, what's happening? <laughs> Tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a very unique time that we're we're living in in regards to cyber and again ai automation i think that the ai let's talk about ai first and then i'll, I'll sure. say why it's relevant for automation in general and just trying to be quick i think what we're seeing with ai ai is really cool 
right? I can go on, I could generate cool images, I could do all this stuff, but we're already seeing cases of AI generating polymorphic malware, malware that changes on a man and things like that. And my gosh, like if I'm a CISO, I am nervous because that means my team that's already working hard now have to deal with everything that comes along with AI and the quickness that happens with AI. And in the industry, we have something that's called dwell time. Dwell time is the point at which an intrusion or attack begins up until which that intrusion is found or discovered. And right. trying to minimize that dwell time is, is the goal of a security practitioner. Why is it relevant for the discussion? Well, now think about it. If you have AI and attackers are going to be using AI or processes to speed them up, they're going to be doing and performing things much more quickly, which means that the dwell time is going to increase if, if you're trying to protect your organization, that's tough. Now where orchestration automation and, and things like that can help. And this is my, my, my founder, right. For Pantera arc levers. And he had this, he called the Eureka moment where he was, um, on the red team, um, for the state of Israel, right. Performing, uh, these, these red teaming tests. And he said, you know, I could wrap this up in automation and the things that I've been doing time and time again. I can, I can wrap up and automate it and help teams become quicker in their testing. So let's bring it back to our conversation about dwell time. So if attackers are now speeding up their processes and they're being quick and we need to speed up our testing as well, because if we test and we wrap automation into testing and we're continuously testing, we now have the ability to understand it goes back to, are those layers working right? And Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We know we're in a better place. I could, I could sleep a little bit better at night knowing that. But this is exactly the challenge. AI is here. It's not going anywhere. And right. now we need to leverage the same type of automation and speed and, and agility in our own testing, whether it's defensive or offensive, to make sure that our security posture is keeping up to speed with the attackers. We don't want to fall behind. Falling behind, I think we're already behind. Attackers do a very good job of working together and doing stuff on the dark web. It's kind of crazy. True. We as security practitioners need to make sure we're running as fast as possible. And it's hard. It's very, very hard. Yeah, 100%. And uh, again, uh, <laughs> I I always feel with, because I have some, some of them that are my friends, I feel with CISOs or anyone who works in the cybersecurity on the customer side, Guys, you know, like really, and I'm not making here any joke about it. Really, you guys, you deserve a, you know, appreciation from everyone. I know that usually your efforts are not seen, but to Jay's point, like, you know, sometimes, yes, you don't sleep well at night because you're always thinking what could happen. And, you know, always this is why we try to get these new technologies, leverage the technologies. And you mentioned something very good. Just kind of a fun, and uh, you know, my my old boss, he used to you know to make joke when he used to start discussion with the customers, and he used to say, uh, you know, like these hackers actually they are like us, they are they have families and you know they have kids, and they need to bring income to the, to the home, right? So, so they need to be one step ahead of everyone else. And actually, he was saying it as a joke, but it's a fact. Yeah, and these guys always are trying, and they leverage the technology. And actually, because they are, they fall in 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 the famous chart in the early adopters, by the way. So once they see something, they are the first ones to go and try it out. Like as organizations, we we don't adopt technologies usually fast. We wait for the early adopters to tell us, okay, this is a tested technology, trusted technology, and wait sometimes one, two, three, four years until we say, yeah, let's try this. But now with AI, I think things are changing, Jay. Uh, Dramatically, I would say, dramatically. And let's see what will happen. Um, Jay, like we are almost done. I've been just thinking, did I miss something? Is there anything that I should have asked you today? <laughs> no, I, I don't I don't think so. I think this is a it's been a great conversation chat with you about about these different topics. Um I, I think you know where I would close this out is um just encourage everyone to remain vigilant. With, with their own um, with their own cybersecurity, meaning, you know, make sure that you're not clicking link, doing the basic stuff, but the basic stuff goes a long way, right? Even right. when we look at social engineering goes a long way. Remember that you could be the entry point into the organization. Remember that your identity matters. 
um, remember that what you do can have a, a large impact on on things. So um, I, I would conclude with that. Um, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out and asking me a bunch of these questions. It's been it's been uh, it's been great. Where people can find more about you, Jay? You can find me on LinkedIn. So um, on LinkedIn, my name is Jason Martang. Um, my name is very unique. So it's Mar Tang. I again, I work for Pentera Security. You can find Pentera at pentera.io. Um, and I'd love to chat uh, more, whether it's about technology, anything else, or about Pentera or, or anything, even your security posture. Let's have a chat because the more we talk amongst ourselves as security professionals, uh, the better off we'll be because there's always something to learn and, and we can always be doing a better job. 100%. I will make sure that I will keep the links in, in the show notes. And, you know, this is how I usually end my uh, episodes. First of all, Jay, I really appreciate you took out the busy time. You are on a busy schedule. So you took out the time this morning for you uh, in, in, in Los Angeles. And for my audience, guys, like really I'm appreciating and I'm loving reading the feedbacks, the reviews. Keep them coming. Don't be shy. Like if, if something you don't like it, let me know about it. Like if, if you want me to focus on something, I never get a guest about it. Also, don't worry. You know, I, I have now the capacity to, to, you know, to get my hands on anyone, I would say, to talk about a topic which for instance, so for you, which related, of course, to the show. And of course, thank you very much for, as I said, leaving the feedback, leaving the reviews. And also don't hesitate to reach out, even if you want to be a guest. Like time zones are not a, any issues. Like, there's 11 hours between me and Jay. I had a guest who was, who was in New Zealand, Japan, you know, all over the world. So time zones is not the issue. And thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, we meet again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hit that subscribe button. Share the show with your tech-savvy friends and fellow entrepreneurs. And leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. Your support means the world to us.